McCaffrey with the National Center for Science Education in Oakland, California. My focus is on climate change education and also recruiting scientific organizations and professional societies to support our work in countering science denial. At the National Center for Science Education, we have been working around science denial issues for many years and we work very closely with what we call the skeptic community and it's a really interesting group of people who some of them are scientists some of them are, some of them are just uh, science aficionados or advocates enthusiasts who just love science they might have seen cosmos as a kid or uh, you know or they had a great teacher who inspired them to pay attention to science even though they didn't necessarily pursue a science career and they call themselves skeptics because they like the skeptical nature of true science of being able to investigate you know claims to see if they're legitimate or not and it's interesting there was a poll conducted recently here in the United States by some religious organizations and they use the term skeptics to describe people who essentially are denying or dismissing climate science and we felt like that was very unfortunate because uh, true skepticism is really the lifeblood of science and and yet it has been kind of hijacked in a certain way by people who say well we don't believe in climate science because we're skeptical of some of these claims that are made and in some way I think skeptical science has done a great job of reclaiming uh, that word for the for science <laughs> uh, and that's really important uh, I I think that there's in terms of using the word denialist or denier uh, it, it's kind of a tricky thing because the sociology community talks about how there is like a spectrum or a continuum of denial and some of it some of it is literal denial and in the case of climate change we still occasionally run into people who are saying climate change isn't happening at all it's a hoax etc so there's a handful of folks who are out there and they're very vocal and it makes they make enough noise that it sounds like there's a lot of them <laughs> uh, but uh, surveys indicate that they're actually a relatively small group uh, and then there's others who are more interpretive denialists, if you will, uh, and they may say, well, climate change is happening, but uh, it's volcanoes or it's solar variability or something like that. It's nothing we can do anything about. But one of the, the trickiest things in, in denial is uh, what sociologist Stanley Cohen calls uh, implicatory denial, which is kind of a strange word, but what he is trying to point to is people who accept the science but deny the implications and deny the responsibility. So th those would be people, he, he has actually not looked at climate change, he's studied more issues of atrocities and genocide and so forth and so what he has found is that uh, people may accept that these, there's these atrocities happening, a, a lot of people here in the United States actually do accept that climate change is happening and humans have something to do with it but they're denying any responsibility uh, you know they'll say well it's the Chinese fault or the Indians fault uh, there's nothing we can do about it uh, we come up with all sorts of excuses for not taking our own responsibility uh, for our contribution and our historic role and also our responsibility to helping others in the world to uh, deal with the challenge of how do we become more resilient, how do we deal with the fact that some of this change that is already happening is unavoidable. So I think if, when we talk about denial it's Im important to realize that it's not just the literal denial or the people who say it's volcanoes, not humans, uh, that we also need to look at the fact that, that uh, there's a sort of shadow denial if you will that has to do with more of our everyday experiences that we accept climate change is happening but it's also unthinkable in a way and, and the idea of actually doing something about it seems impossible in our every, everyday lives. The science is obviously very complex, it crosses many disciplines and 
historically in the United States, it has tended to fall through the cracks. And there's a couple of reasons behind that. One is that we had national science education standards developed in the mid-1990s that did not include climate change and very little about climate in general. As a result, a lot of the states, when they developed their own state standards, didn't include climate change. And then, of course, you know, it crosses so many disciplines that even if it is in like an earth science course, it may not reach a lot of students because earth science might be a class that only a handful of students who are going on to college actually take. So it's, there's a lot of reasons behind why climate change has not been taught or not been taught well here in the United States. And in other countries, it may be a very different dynamic because some countries have national curriculum and climate change is in that. Uh, there was a study done recently about Chinese college students versus American college students. And lo and behold, Chinese college students know about climate change and many US college students don't. And that's just a reflection of the fact that we have a very different system here in the US. And as a result, uh, way too many students graduate from high school and even college without ever learning the basics. Uh, personally, I think that education is a major driver. There was a study done by Tony Leiserwitz back in 2010. It's one of the few studies that's really looked in depth at people's knowledge about climate change. And what he saw at that point was that fewer than one in five students say that they're learning a great deal about climate change in the US. Um, and then he, those, those of you familiar with the Six Americas framework, they have these six audience segments ranging from alarmed at one end to disengaged and dismissive on the other end. And that uh, he found that the more people know about climate change, the better they do on these knowledge quizzes. Uh, and at the same time, a lot of the alarmed failed the, the, to, to get all the answers right themselves. And in, in a few cases, there were instances where people who were dismissive of climate science and didn't take climate change seriously uh, knew a little bit more about some aspect of the greenhouse effect or something like that. But uh, by and large, if you know more, you're going to be more alarmed was what he found. I think in public attitudes, it's enormous. There's a lot of the research around cult cultural cognition and so forth. Uh, and there's obviously a lot of truth to the fact that, uh, especially if you don't, if you've never learned the basics yourself and you're forced to piece together your understanding of climate change from bits and pieces of information from the media, from you know, people that you trust locally, your uncle or whatever, <laughs> uh, then you end up with a very kind of chaotic understanding of climate change and whether or not it's a serious issue. So, when it comes to ideological and cultural frames, especially when there's such a lack of understanding of the basics to begin with, uh, the cultural frame often wins out uh, over ignorance or, or over shallow understanding, shall we say. The public really needs to have some basic understanding of climate literacy in order to make informed decisions. And obviously not everybody has to be a climatologist uh, or a renewable energy expert, but to understand that climate change is happening, it, this time around it's caused by humans, that it's actually very serious, especially on the tra trajectory we're going right now, and there's very practical things that we can do to minimize the impacts and prepare for the changes that are already well underway. When people understand the basics, then they can make informed choices, whether it's in the voting booth or in their everyday lives uh, or in their careers that, that can really make a difference. So uh, climate literacy is enormously important. It's been overlooked or treated as an afterthought for far, far too long. You know, we've tried to use political persuasion and we've tried to find shortcuts so that, that uh, we can, you know, put money behind a particular campaign, and therefore, the, whoever wins that campaign might have a better climate policy down the line. 
why don't we invest some of that money into making sure that people, especially young people, have the understanding and get the tools and talent that they need to be able to not only make informed choices, but uh, pursue careers that'll make a real difference in the long term. 1992, the, the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change was ratified by the nations of the world. And in that, Article 6 of the convention talks about education, training, and public awareness. And we've essentially done nothing, particularly in the United States. You know, the, 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 or we've been, done very little. So Article 6 talks about every nation needs to develop their own strategy for informing people, for providing public access to information, and really importantly, for helping them participate in developing adequate responses to climate change. That was over 20 years ago, and we've done very, very little. The, the one thing that the United States has done probably uh, in a very exemplary way is provided public access to climate information. But if you don't know where to find it or how to use it, if you're not learning about it in school and making use of data in school uh, as part of a science class or a mathematics class, uh, then it's really not going to make sense to you. And, you know, that's contributed. We, we've lost 20 years, from, from, from my point of view, uh, by dilly-dallying and trying to find these other shortcuts. Uh, so why not, as a, sort of a all-hands-on-deck, all-the-above strategy, try a little education for a change because it's been overlooked for two decades. When teachers come to us and ask us, you know, I'm hearing this kind of excuse about why it's just natural cycles or this or that, uh, we, we point them to skeptical science because that's really the go-to place where you've got the simple answer to the question, you, you've got it super well organized, and it, for those who want to drill more into the actual data behind it and the actual science papers, uh, skeptical science provides access to that as well, which is just an incredible resource. Uh, but, uh, you, you know, I think there's a lot that can be done just to help build people's capacity to make sense of different types of information. If, if it's your uncle who just has a strong opinion about climate change is a hoax because blah, 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 you know, is there anything behind that? <laughs> and, you know, understandably, people have to be making decisions about the battles that they fight, whether it's on the home front, uh, around the, the kitchen table, or, or around a family gathering, do you really want to pick an argument with your uncle about whether climate change is a hoax or not? Or do we want to uh, try to make sure that young people are learning in school about the, the basics of climate, the basics of energy? The next generation science standards here in the United States have set up a really kind of ideal situation where even starting in kindergarten, young people are learning about the basics of climate and weather and how do we try to min minimize our impact on the environment in general. And then by the time they get to middle school, sixth, seventh, eighth grade, they learn more about climate change due to greenhouse gases. You know, before that, uh, they don't really have a firm enough understanding of the Earth system, carbon cycle, and so forth to really fully grasp climate change. Uh, you know, at the same time, a lot of times they'll have heard about it from their relatives or from the media and to, to be planting the seeds with them that, that uh, there's unanswered questions in science that we still are wrestling with, there's career paths that are really exciting that uh, don't exist today, that, that if they can start to think about how can we move towards a low carbon society, uh, there's just well nigh infinite <laughs> opportunities for young people to carve out entrepreneurial uh, opportunities for themselves. One of the characteristics that we see of people that uh, d deny, for instance, evolution is they will use sort of a pseudo-scientific approach to nitpick things to death. We see the same thing in climate science and they don't like being called deniers because the word is sometimes associated with uh, Holocaust deniers or, or flat earth people or whatever, 
so w when they use that argument, it, it, I think it, it's just to try to distract from the real issue, and sometimes it's a, su a successful distraction. What we have seen historically with people who deny evolution, and here in the United States, it's mainly been focused on wanting to have an alternative version like creationism or more recently intelligent design taught side by side with evolution in public schools. And the courts in this country have deemed that, that to be unconstitutional, that you can't do that in a, in a, because of the separation of church and state in the United States. But uh, the similarities are that uh, the techniques are often to say that the science is bad, in other, in other, in other words, uh, what they'll say is Darwinism slash evolution is bad science, it's flawed, and therefore our more robust alternative theory should be taught uh, because there's all these other, other unanswered questions. So we see similarities with climate change where people will say uh, that it's solar variability or cosmic rays or volcanoes are the problem. And so the, attacking the science and also saying that the conse consequences will be bad. With evolution, they'll say that if people think they come from monkeys, that's going to have all sorts of terrible implications on the morale of society or the morality of society. <laughs> and in the case of climate change, the implications of the science are that uh, it's anti-capitalistic to, to suggest alternatives. It's uh, going to destroy the economy. Or one of the more clever ones is to say that uh, it's going to take money away from fighting poverty, that global poverty is really the big issue we should focus on. Climate change is not such a big deal. And therefore, if we're putting money into climate change, it'll take away money from dealing with poverty. So that, that's, in a way, that's a very clever gimmick to try to uh, distract from the implications of the science. And so the, there's, there's those type of similarities. There's a little bit of overlap in, in some of the cast of characters. So for instance, uh, there's a, one particular fundamentalist Christian group in the United States that has ties to some politically uh, left or right-wing organizations and th so they make that case that, that uh, climate change is, is a hoax and spending money on climate change will take money away from poverty efforts. But uh, by and large in this country, and I, I suspect in Australia and other parts of the world where denial of the climate science arises, the profile seems to be that uh, the people that make the argument that the climate science is bad tend to be free market adherents who see the climate science as a threat to their ideology. And I think that that uh, has, as I say, a little bit of overlap with some of the religious groups, but there's actually, to the credit of many religious organizations, around the world, many take the climate change very seriously, whether it's certain evangelical groups in this country, certainly the Catholic Church and most world religions take uh, stewardship of the environment uh, and, and addressing climate change and poverty as uh, core issues. So there have been some interesting efforts in the United States to try to infiltrate climate denial into classrooms through developing curriculum. Uh, not too many of them have made headway. So for instance, a couple years ago, the Heartland Institute announced that they were gonna develop curriculum that would be alternative curriculum that middle and high school students could benefit from in their, in their view <laughs> to show sort of the other side of uh, what was being taught. I think the more insidious issue in many schools is the fact that uh, it's not being taught at all <laughs> in many instances. We're actually in the middle of a 
survey of middle and high school teachers here in the United States to determine whether they're teaching climate change, how they're teaching it, where they're teaching it, and we'll know much more in a couple months uh, about sort of the, the overall landscape. But what we have seen, as I mentioned, there's a, a Lizarowitz study from 2010 that found one, one in five students have learned much about climate change in school. Uh, it's probably gone up a little bit since then, but uh, we won't know until we get this survey completed uh, to see how much of an increase there ha has been. But uh, the big concern for us is that all too many teachers are teaching both sides of what's really a phony controversy. So they'll have students debate whether climate change is happening or not. Uh, they'll encourage them to go visit different websites, maybe point them to the Heartland Institute website where they can find out uh, some of these spurious claims about the validity of the science. Uh, in you know the basic, the best case scenario when they do that type of activity is that the students will realize quickly that uh, the the science on climate change that's peer reviewed is really robust, and the the pseudoscience is very thin and uncredible. Uh, but uh, you can't guarantee that students in a middle school classroom are going to be able to know the difference and. If the teachers themselves don't have the background, then we've got a problem. And uh, you know, we've heard recently that teachers in Oklahoma, for instance, uh, are teaching both sides of this phony controversy on a very regular basis. And it, it's hard to counter that because in the United States, there's this notion of fairness and balance that uh, is very ingrained in. American society and uh, epitomized on Fox News. They're, they're all about uh, being balanced and fair, supposedly, and you decide. <laughs> you know? uh, there's some huge problems with that if people don't understand the basic science to begin with, if they've never learned uh, you know, how climate and weather are related but different uh, and so forth. Uh, so being able to make informed choices and understand the science does require that literacy be an integral part, uh, you know, starting ideally in elementary school. When it comes to this teaching the controversy notion, we discourage it very strongly in, in a science classroom in particular. There may be classes where you can use debate and rhetoric, uh, you know, having somebody make a case for their particular point of view in a civics class, in a writing and rhetoric class, for instance, uh, social studies perhaps, where you can talk about uh, the political landscape and so forth. But in a science classroom in particular, young people are there to learn about the science. And all too often climate change has been missing. Hopefully we can remedy that quickly with the next generation science standards and so forth. But uh, there's a, a push to include argumentation as a part of a science class. And again, this is very tricky territory because argumentation can also be translated as debate. And in fact, uh, argumentation really just means making a strong case and presenting it in a way where you, you've uh, got strong evidence to, to back your claim and that you're able to Peer, you're able to present that to your peers. And of course, that's how science works through peer-reviewed journals and so forth. Uh, and it's a good skill for young people to learn. At the same time, if you're going to be using argumentation slash debate in a science classroom, it's really vital that the science be authentic, that the science be current, that you're not coming up with uh, something that's a 20-year-old deba debate about uh, whether or not scientists uh, believe this or that. We, we have all these maps from the various models that show different parts of the planet heating up. You know, the, the eight watts per meter squared looks like uh, 10 to 12 degrees Fahrenheit average warming in, in a lot of the United States uh, by the end of the century. So forget about two degrees 
global mean whatever, you know. <laughs> Uh, that, that's, uh, uh, from my point of view as, a, as an educator, that's a useless number. Uh, and, and four is no better, frankly. <laughs> we, we, we really need to start making the connection between climate and energy, uh, both in terms of the Earth system, but also in terms of how energy in our lives uh, and how we consume energy today is going to have a huge influence on climate in the future. Humans are a force of nature, and we are mo causing more soil to erode than all the natural processes on the earth combined. We have been clever enough to figure out how to fix nitrogen for fertilizers, and we now fix more nitrogen than all the bacteria on the planet. We are a force of nature, and we have also discovered how to take buried solar energy from the ground, we call it fossil fuels, and dig it up, pump it up, and then burn it to generate energy for our lives. And this has transformed the, the world in enormous ways. It's given us this standard of living that we enjoy and are sometimes frustrated by because it's so hectic and chaotic sometimes. Uh, but uh, there's been many benefits that we have to acknowledge have come out of this reliance on fossil fuels. The problem is when we're burning that buried solar energy, we're also releasing Carbon dioxide, you know, fossil fuels are essentially formed through photosynthesis from millions of years ago, where sunlight is combined by plants and, and other creatures to pull carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere with water and, and turn it into a fuel. And then it's transformed over time into fossil fuels. And when we burn that fossil fuel for energy, it releases carbon dioxide into the atmosphere that is adding to the imbalance of the Earth's climate system. And rather than talking about temperature, I, you know, we talk about two degrees warming in, in this country. That really doesn't mean much because two degrees is actually, they're talking about Celsius. In this country, it's Fahrenheit uh, that rules and two degrees Fahrenheit doesn't seem like very much. Uh, but rather than talking about temperature, I, I found it much more, I think, accurate and helpful to talk about the amount of energy that we're adding to the Earth's climate system. Since 1750, when the Industrial Revolution started, we've increased the amount of energy in the Earth's system about three watts per meter squared, or, or less than that, actually. If we continue burning fossil fuels as if there were no tomorrow, sort of this burn baby burn scenario, uh, we will, by the end of the century, reach over eight watts per meter squared. And by the year 2200, that'll go up to t over 12 watts per meter squared. And so we're not talking about just a little bit of warming, global warming. We're talking about a heating that is, is really unprecedented. And we're currently on that trajectory. We're heading towards eight white watts per meter squared by the end of this century, 12 watts per meter squared by 2200. And that is the reality. So uh, we have altered the Earth's clim climate system and other environmental systems in profound ways. And we should be smart enough, <laughs> theoretically, uh, through education, uh, to be able to really transform society so that we can minimize those changes. We can turn schools into living laboratories where there's solar panels and energy efficiency throughout the buildings where we're able to infuse all the sciences, not just the earth science, but the physics and the chemistry and the biology, with the social studies, with the mathematics, with the civics, with art and so forth. So th this is happening. It's, it's not just pie in the sky. Schools are actually doing that here and there. And many more can and should do that in the coming years and decades, uh, because that's what it'll take for us to, to not head towards uh, uh, over eight watts per meter squared. And we should be smart enough, <laughs> theoretically, 